church today? That's an important question. You know, when you gather together, God has a purpose. God has something he wants to do. And it's important for us to understand why, why we're here. And so I'm going to tell you why I'm here. And I believe it's the same reason that you're here is that I'm here to destroy the works of the devil. Yes. 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 And um, how many of you know that the devil's alive and well? And he's obviously well, but he's alive. And he is certainly wreaking havoc on the people of America and around the world. And uh, our job is to destroy the works of the devil. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, it says, Jesus came for this purpose that he might destroy the works of the devil. Amen. 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 And so today I'm going to uh, equip you. That's basically my role right now in the body of Christ is to equip the body to do the works of the ministry, to equip us with tools. And I'm going to give you a tool today, but at the same time, this tool is going to have an effect on you as well. Uh, there will be continued healings that will take place today. Some of you are going to get set free from maybe a long-term depression or discouragement or tormenting thoughts and or dreams, things like that. They're going to go away because we're going to deal with some root causes of why they're there in the first place. All right? How many are on board for that? Um, I think it's important, you know, I, I think we should be excited about Jesus. Amen. You know, you said, well, uh, I think we should act like we're excited. First of all, right? I, I, I didn't see this here, but I used to, I, I traveled for years. I did. I traveled with Larry Lee for two and a half years doing Could You Not Carry One Hour Seminar. I also traveled for five years doing seminars and churches and everything. And, you know, I would always say, you know, um, you know, if you've got the joy of the Lord, you ought to inform your face. <laughs> so some, you know, some saints have been baptized in lemon juice. And, so. and that's not you, I'm not saying that, but I just think we ought to be excited. Now, you know, um, you say, well, I'm, I'm just too old to be excited. Well, I'm 73 years old, about to be 74. Come on, what's your excuse? <laughs> and <laughs> if you were to visit our church uh, in Santa Maria, which is called The Bridge, um, uh, as in worship, people are yelling, shouting, and it's not, a, it's not Pentecostal. I mean, it's not because of that. It's not because of any traditions. It's because God is there, and people are super, they can't help themselves. And, and it, our church is filled with desperate people. I love that. Not religious people, but desperate people. And they're excited. And, uh, and, and one of the reasons they're excited is because some of us older folks, we sit on the front row and we yell too. <laughs> In fact, we're the first ones to yell. <laughs> and, and that catch on. And we're, and we're, you and I, not everybody here, as I know in your 70s, or I don't know how old you are, but anyhow. <laughs> we're supposed to lead the way. We're supposed yeah. to pass on you know, what God has done in our lives to the next generation. Oh, yeah. And uh, I'm not saying we have to get up and do flip-flops for Jesus, but if you can, still, that might be a good idea. You know, or whatever. But I think, you know, how long you've been saved shouldn't be a dial down, you know. To, I used to be really excited about God, now I'm about to enter into the glory gates, you know, here. And I'm all, you know, I'm all mellowed out. Now you ought to be the most excited people in the church. And uh, so anyhow, so today I want to talk to you about uh, turning offenses into opportunities. Uh, probably the main weapon, and there's a number of weapons that the enemy uses against us, but probably in the top three weapons that he uses is offenses. How, let me ask questions to make sure I'm talking to the right people. How many of you have ever been offended? 
Yes. How many of you have ever offended someone? <laughs> Same people, right? <laughs> Good to be on both sides of that. Uh, now, it's really interesting, and we can see it today. Probably in my lifetime, I've never seen people so easily offended as in the day we're living in right now. You know, Jesus in Matthew 24, the disciples said, can you tell us what are the signs of your coming? And he said, wars, rumors of wars, sicknesses, diseases, nation against nation, earthquakes, and different places. But then he gave one, we'll put it on the screen here, in Matthew 24, verses 10 to 12. In fact, he says it twice in Matthew 24. He says this, and then many will be offended. So one of the signs of the last days is how is, is that people will be offended. I mean, you, you cannot not offend people today. If you killed yourself, it would offend somebody. You did that on purpose to hurt me. No matter what you agree or disagree with, it offends somebody else. And so, I believe it's the devil's weapon to keep people from reaching their potential in God. So here in Matthew 24, verses 10 through 12, and then many will be offended and will betray one another and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will arise and deceive many. Now there's a tie-in there. <clears throat> Offenses give the opportunity for false prophets to arise. Right, yeah. That's wow. true. Wow. Then it says, and because lawlessness, never in my life have I seen lawlessness <laughs> like I see it today. Right. Lawlessness will abound and the love of many will grow cold. Jesus in Luke uh, 17, 1 said this, and Jesus said to his disciples, it is impossible that no offenses should come. I bet you don't have that verse on your refrigerator. <laughs> <laughs> but woe to him to whom they come. Uh, and, and I don't have it on the overhead, but Matthew 18, 7 Jesus said, woe to the world because of offenses, for event offenses must come. Mm -hmm. So offenses are a part of life. Jesus said there has to, there's going to be offenses. You know, you know, we say all the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ Jesus, including the promise that there will be offenses. <laughs> <laughs> And so there is a demonic purpose for offenses, but then there is a God purpose for offenses. You know, God has a plan for offenses. And we're going to we'll talk about that in this, what I'm going to share. But we need to understand that offenses are actually designed to be an opportunity for us. Nobody's amen. <laughs> Can we have another speaker, please? <laughs> this message on offenses is offending me already. <laughs> Good. We want to offend the devil. Amen. Right? So let's pray, and we'll jump right in here. Father, we thank you so much that you're going to have a glorious church, a glorious bride without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. We thank you that your word is clear in Romans chapter 8. All things work together for good to those that love you are of the call according to your purpose. And your purpose is that we might be conformed to the image of Jesus. There was no one ever in all the history of the world that was offended as Jesus. And yet he rose above it. So, Father, today we ask you to help us. We ask you to open our eyes. Holy Spirit, we say, let's go, Holy Spirit. We want to hear from you. We want to be equipped. We want to have ammunition, as Pam said, that we might destroy the works of the devil. 
And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, if you agree with that, say amen. 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 Well, there's three sources of offenses, three ways that offenses come. Number one, we get offended by God. Now, you know, we don't want to admit that as Christians, but the fact is, if we pray a prayer, it didn't happen. We were believing for someone to be healed. They died. Uh, you know, we, were, we thought we were getting this job and it didn't work out. Uh, you know, we got hit. Our, what happened in our marriage, it, it, it invited all this. You know, we went through a divorce. We went through all these things. Where were you, God? Right? Where were you? And so we, or we've been abused, especially in this generation right now. And so we get offended with God. The second source of offenses, which is all you have to do is look around the room, <laughs> is that we get offended by people, right? Some of you got offended on the freeway on the way here this morning. We get offended by others, their actions toward us, their attitudes toward us, or they just ignore us. Or even some people's personalities just offend us. I had that problem for years. I got delivered from it. I, my role in the church was to offend people with my personality. In fact, I remember years ago, we got into, we got into Matthew 18, which talks about if your brother offends you, you need to go to your brother, right? We called it Matthew 18 in each other. <laughs> so our, our pastor, we were, I was not a pastor back then, but our pastor really got into this. We need to go out. If you, someone's offended you, then you need to go to your brother. And I had a line of people lined up outside my door, down my sidewalk, oh, wanting to come to tell me how I had offended them. <laughs> we get offended by other people's successes. You know, why are they getting blessed? I am the Christian. <laughs> so we get offended by God, we get offended by others, and then we don't even need any help. We offend ourselves. <laughs> by our own sins, our own mistakes, our bad decisions, stupid things that we do, we offend ourselves. We don't even need the devil's help. <laughs> So we get offended by God, we get offended by other people, and we get offended by ourselves. Now, God's glory comes where there's unity. Shows up where there's unity. Jesus' prayer in John 17, he said, Father, make them one, even as you and I are one, that they would be perfected in unity. And then he said this, and the glory that you have given me, it's going to come on them. Now, Psalms 133. It's funny, I woke up at 133 this morning, and right away I thought of Psalms 133. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It's like the oil that's poured on the head of Aaron that goes down his beard, down to the hem of his garment. It's like the dew that falls on the mountains of Zion. It says, and there God commands... A blessing. And so one of the roles of fivefold ministry, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, and I would encourage you, uh, here just a, a couple weeks ago, uh, God directed Pam and I to go to the Golden Gate Bridge, and we, we uh, did a live stream from the Golden Gate Bridge, and we, one of, and we were there, God sent us there to pray for the unity of the body of Christ. And one of the things that we prayed in our prayer from the Golden Gate Bridge was, and we're praying over California, uh, was that calling forth true apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Why do we need those? Because Ephesians 4 tells us that one of their roles is to bring about the unity of the church. So we need all those ministries to be functioning. And, and genuine ones, not yeah. somebody who puts a, you know, if, a, if somebody walked in and they got apostle so-and-so on their shirt, be assured they're not an apostle. <laughs> but the point being, we need the full five-fold ministry for the maturing of the saints till we grow up into him so that we can have unity, so everyone can be activated in who God's called them to be and do what God's called them to do. 
And so God, obviously God's for unity. I don't know why everybody else hasn't figured that out. <laughs> and I think the, you know, the internet's good in some ways, but it's really bad in other ways. Because it makes everybody an expert. And everybody starts attacking everybody else, telling everybody who's not of God. That is such a dangerous area to function in. You're beating up God's bride. Who do you think you are? And so if we're going to see a move of God in a Tascadero in North County, it's going to be because there's unity that's happening. Does that mean that all churches are going to come together? No. But God's people, it, to me, uh, you know, I, I've been blowing this trumpet that ever since I've been in California. To me, unity is not an option. It's an absolute thing. We have to agree with it. And offenses are the number one cause of disunity in the church. People would say, oh, no, it's just that I don't agree with your doctrine. Give me a break. <laughs> I agree that we need to confront false doctrine. I'm not against that. I agree with that. But most people, the reason that they're divided from the church is because they've been offended and they didn't know what to do with it. Right? And so unity brings glory and power and the power of God and offenses are the number one cause of disunity. All right? Now, how do you know you may be sitting here saying, hey, I'm sure glad I'm listening to this message because I don't have any of this problem. <laughs> By the end of this message, you will have this problem. You'll <laughs> <laughs> be giving me the left foot of fellowship. You know. I'm just kidding. All right. How do you know if you have an unresolved offense? All right. Here it is. Let me give you some of the symptoms of you have an offense that you haven't resolved. Number one, from time to time, you rehearse the offense in your mind and you re-experience the hurt and the emotion of it. Now, I'm not saying that once in a while some thought comes to you. I'm talking about you bring this up and here's this, you so-and-so offended you and you replay it like an instant replay in your mind and you feel the pain of it and all that. If you're doing that, there's a good chance you have an unresolved offense. Number two, you're experiencing continuing tormenting thoughts and fears, which I'll explain in a little bit here. But if you're having tormenting dreams, tormenting thoughts, that, that was one of the ways I saw that I had, I had been offended many, many years ago, and I thought I dealt with it until I was in a meeting where the presence of God was really strong, and all of a sudden I, was, I had resurrected the whole thing. It was right there. And the Lord said, you still are holding unforgiveness for this situation. Here's another one. And by the way, I was having tormenting thoughts and, and dreams. Number three, here's a pretty sure one. You can't look the person in the eye. You're at Costco, and you notice they're coming down the aisle, and you make your way to another aisle <laughs> to avoid them. If you happen to be still going to the same church, you've got to make sure you're sitting far away mm -hmm. from that cursed person, right? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Here's another sign you might have an unresolved offense. You're continually changing churches, jobs, and friends. You know, you're, changing. you're trying to find the perfect church, but when you get there, it's not going to be perfect anymore. <laughs> There's something wrong with everybody else but you. Here's another sign you might have an unresolved offense, and that is you have a critical, suspicious spirit, and you call it discernment. <laughs> that you, you know, every time somebody says anything or something comes up, well, I'm not so sure about that. And so you could have an unresolved offense. Here's a sure sign, you're a loner. You can't be around people. We need people. We need each other. We need the fellowship of the church. Our church did not shut down during this whole situation. And our church has blown up. Amen. Because of that. Praise the Lord. 
And we, and we had people get COVID. We had, we had people die in our church. But that didn't stop us from getting together because the Bible says we need to have fellowship. Yeah. That's one of the four things that is listed in Acts chapter 2, that we need fellowship. Because we need the body of Christ. Every one of you. You need each other. I need you. That's right. Here's another one. Last reason that I would say you might have an unresolved offense. You're easily offended and you take up offenses for others regularly. <laughs> if you're walking around and man, you, you just walk around with this chip on your shoulder or you're just waiting for somebody to just whack that chip off of there so <laughs> you can be offended at them. <laughs> for sure you have an unresolved offense. Now what happens when we don't forgive others who offend us? Well, there's several things that happen to us. Number one, when we don't forgive people, we hinder and damage our relationship with God. Because see, God is a forgiving God. Colossians chapter 3, verse 13, Paul writes and says, Bearing with one another, forgiving one another, if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so also must you do. As I mentioned in my prayer, the greatest offense that ever happened on the face of the earth was God himself being crucified by the people he had created. Yeah. Being spit upon, being beaten, right? Being whipped. He said, well, I wasn't there. But if you would have been there, I would have done something different. No, we're all Barabbas. Come on. <laughs> Ephesians 4.32 says, Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ forgave you. And here's Jesus hanging on the cross, having become sin for us all, having taken upon his body every known disease to man. He is so, it says he was so marred, you could not recognize him as a human being. And from the cross, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. So I figure if Jesus, who is the most offended person ever on the planet Earth, if he could forgive, my little deal is it's not a big thing, right? When we don't forgive, here's another reason. When we don't forgive, we open ourselves to deception because sin is deceitful. And unforgiveness is sin. We have to see unforgiveness is not just a choice. It's, it's a sin mm -hmm. that we need to repent of. And in Hebrews 3.13 it says, But exhort one another daily while it is still called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. So we, we, can, we once we, if we get offended, we can easily be deceived. Third thing that happens when we don't forgive. We get turned over... The Bible says to tormenting spirits. This is Matthew 18, verse 34. But he, the, the, Jesus, did, you know, Peter came to Jesus one day, and he said this. He says, how many times shall I forgive my brother, at, you know, when he sins against me? Seven? And he goes, seven? Now, Peter actually thought he was impressing Jesus. <laughs> you can see the Pharisees, the Pharisees' rule were, you were to forgive somebody three times. If they offended you the fourth time, it's eye for eye and tooth for tooth. Right? So Jesus like, man, I'm going to go four more than the Pharisees. And of course, Jesus shocked Peter. He says, no, 70 times seven. And then Jesus told a parable of a man who owed a king a great amount of money, if you, in today's terms, it would have been like $10 million. He owed the king $10 million, and the king called for him to come in. He was going to throw him into prison, uh, and, you know, because of the debt. And the guy fell down and said, forgive me my debt. And it says the king had mercy on him and forgave him the debt. The guy got up right up after being forgiven this great debt, went out, and he saw a guy who owed him 100 bucks. And it says he went to him and he grabbed him by the throat and said, pay me all or I'm going to throw you into prison. And, and, and the guy said, forgive me. And it says the man who had just been forgiven the $10 million debt, debt says he would, it says he would not forgive him and had him thrown into prison. Well, some of the servants of the king were observing this 
happening, and they went to the king and said, hey, that guy that you forgave the $10 million debt won't forgive this other guy a $100 debt. You know, debt. The king called for him to come back in. He said, I forgave you that great debt. Why could you not forgive your brother who owed you so little? And it says, and the king said to the soldiers, take him and turn him over to the tormentors. And so when we don't forgive, we get torn, turned over to tormenting spirits. The fourth thing that happens, when we don't forgive, we allow a root of bitterness to take root in us. And many times this leads to causing division in the church and we defile others with our negative spirit. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15, it says, Looking carefully, lest we fall short of the grace of God, lest a root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by this many become defiled. That's a, defiled is kind of a strong word, isn't it? So, when, so what happens is when we hold unforgiveness in us, over a period of time, it festers like a festering in a wound, and it becomes then uh, infected, and then it becomes something that can infect other people as well. And I've seen this happen in people's lives. Here's another one, and that is when we don't forgive, we put ourselves in a prison of hurt and suspicion and an inability to love and trust others, even ourselves. I think it was Joyce Myers that said, she said, uh, holding unforgiveness is, you know, it's like this. It's like, you know, somebody offends me, and I said, you know, or they offend me, and I said, I know what I'm going to do. I'm just not going to forgive them. That's what I'm going to do. That's really, I'm just going to not forgive them. Boy, I'm going to show them. I'm not, they don't even know you. They, they, they yeah. offended you. Right. Yeah. yeah, right. And so the only person you're hurting is you. So Joyce Meyer said, she said, holding in forgiveness is like drinking poison thinking you're hurting the other person. And so we only imprison ourselves in bitterness, in resentment, right, anger, when we hold in forgiveness. Now, here's an interesting thing. How we respond to offenses determines whether we go to a higher level in God's grace and love or are buried in a life of bitterness and resentment. Now, remember I said earlier, God has a purpose in, in, in offenses. The devil wants to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to destroy your faith, your love, your progress in the kingdom, your ability to connect with other people. He wants to destroy. But you know what? God, God knew that that offenses are going to come. That's why that's a promise in the Bible. Offenses will come. How you and I, here's God's purpose. In fact, if you look at any, pretty much all the great people mentioned in the Bible, Moses, Joseph, David, you know how they got promoted? Through offenses. So permit offenses can either be your tombstone or your stepping stone to another place in God. Every time you respond properly to offenses, you get promoted in the kingdom of God. It's so like, thank you very much. That's true. I'm looking forward to my next offense. Count it all joy. That's right, count it all joy. So there's no, there's no going higher in God's kingdom except through offenses. I mean, that's not the only way, but that's one of the ways that we get promoted. Mm -hmm. And the re one of the reasons is because we're responding just like God would respond. Mm -hmm. So, how do we respond properly to offenses? How do we respond properly to offenses? So, I'm just going to give them to you all. There's, I've got five. I'm just going to just say them right now, and then I'll break them down for you. Okay, you ready? All right, here's what you do. Don't nurse them, don't curse them, don't rehearse them, disperse them, and God will reverse them. All right? Don't nurse them, don't curse them, don't rehearse them, disperse them, and God will reverse them. So what do we mean by don't nurse them? 
nurse, don't nurse them is when we sit around, bit offended, and we're licking our wounds. We, we're, we're having a pity party, and we, we, our offense is like our newborn baby. We go around and we want to show everybody, did you see my, did you see this offense? Look at that. And you're having a, a pity party that nobody else wants to attend. We lose our joy. We, we go around and, oh, woe is me, you know. Everybody's against me. Get over it. Grow up. <laughs> so, number one, let's all say that. Don't, no, don't yes, nurse them. Yes, don't yes, nurse them, yes, okay? Yes. The second thing we do with offenses is don't curse them. What do we mean by don't curse them? That's when we develop an attitude of revenge and bitterness that de and let bitterness develop in us, causing us to become negative, critical, cynical people. Yeah. And so we're going to get, I remember when I was young, I, I was always the biggest kid when I was in grade school, and so I got picked on a lot for being the biggest kid. And I, I was, obviously, this is way before I was a Christian, and, and, uh, and, and so I, at night I would go home and I would get under my covers in my bed, and I'd picture myself in a jet with machine guns straping their houses, <laughs> shooting up their whole family. I'm going to get revenge. And, uh, and so when we develop this attitude of revenge, I, I, this, years ago when I first started pastoring, I was pastoring in a small town in Missouri. And um, uh, we had a small group of pastors in the town, and we would get together, and this one pastor of this one church just had it out for me, that he hated our church. We were the only charismatic Pentecostal church, you know, in that area. And, um, and so we, every time we would get in a, a meeting of the pastors, he would verbally, out loud, you know, tell them, this guy should not be in the ministry, wow. you know, this, this is, you know, he would just put me down uh, over and over and over again. And uh, anyhow, we had a, a community service one time, and we had borrowed hymnals from his church, and I was taking them back to his church after it was an Easter sunrise service or something like that that we did. And I was bringing the, the hymnals back, and he happened to be there, standing out front, and he said, hey, uh, I, why don't you come on back to my office? And I thought, hey, this guy's going to, something's changed. <laughs> this is great, you know. And so I'm walking down this long hallway to the back of the church to his office, and the Holy Spirit speaks to me and says, whatever he says, you don't say anything. Whatever he says, don't, you don't say anything. And so I sit down in his office. We're about five feet apart. He's in a chair. I'm sitting in a chair here. And he starts off with, do you know this whole city hates you? Oh. That was the first statement. Wow. That was the opening <laughs> line. And so I'm sitting there, whatever he says, don't say anything. <laughs> so I didn't respond. So he got a little louder and then said another thing. I didn't respond to that either. Then he got a little louder. And in, in a few moments, he's yelling. And then the last, like the last part, he's five inches from my face, oh beat red, screaming in my face. Wow. And now at this point, I took my hands and stuck them under my legs. <laughs> because I was going to knock them out. <laughs> in the name of Jesus. <laughs> And it was like he just kind of fell back into his chair. He had run out of <laughs> stuff, you know, out of this. And so I stood up and said, well, thank you very much. <laughs> and not in, a, not in a cynical way, you know, not, I just, not in a, what, how do you say it? Wow. Uh, sarcastically, I said, thank you very much. And so I'm walking out of church. I'm so proud of myself. <laughs> I didn't say anything, and then I went out and got in my car, and boy, the revenge came on. <laughs> I'm going to go home and get my shotgun, and I'm going to shoot the windows out of his house. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't do that. <laughs> so we don't, we don't nurse them, 
We don't curse them. We don't take up revenge. revenge vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Right? Amen. The third thing we do with offenses is, and this is a big one, don't rehearse them. Don't rehearse them. Now, what I mean by rehearsing them is that we tell other people about the offense. We go to them, and uh, by the way, Proverbs says, when you hear one side of the story, it sounds like that's the truth. <laughs> but, but that's not true, because you have to hear both sides of the story to get the truth. And so we go to other people who are not a part of the problem or the solution, and we rehearse the, this uh, offense that we've had with them. Now, if we're Christians, we have a very sneaky way to do that. We all like, we go like this. I go, hey, let's all stand in a circle and hold hands. We need to pray for Joe. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> right? Come on, guys, we need to pray for Joe. Yeah. Lord, we, right now, we go, you know how Joe's been attacking all of us? <laughs> he says, you know, all those mean things that he, you know. So we cover our rehearsal and make it look like it's spiritual. Yeah. Now, when we rehearse our offenses, Here's the following things. There are three things that happen. Number one, and somebody said it over here already, the offense becomes larger than it really was. We embellish. We add things. You know, maybe they just didn't talk to us at church one Sunday. After we have rehearsed it about five times, they killed our dog. <laughs> right? We, the, 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 the offense gets bigger every time we share it. Here's another one. The hurt goes deeper into our heart every time we share it. Because offense is like a sword that's been stuck into you. And every time you rehearse it, you grab the hilt of that sword and you push it down deeper into you. That's true. Then here's another one. And that is other people become defiled back by our bad report and pick up an offense toward the person who offended us. In other words, if I get together with you and I want to tell you something about Delinda that she did wrong to me, she hasn't done anything wrong to me, but bless her. <laughs> uh, tell about that. Next time you see Delinda, you're like, hmm. Wow. Hmm. You did something that you Right? Because I just infected you. That's right. Right? With, with, with something. It may not be true or not. It's probably not, not true you know, at all. But somehow by me... By me sharing this, rehearsing the offense with you, it causes you to see that other person in a different way. It's true. Wow. You know we're in 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter, right? 1 Corinthians 13. You know it says love believes all things? It doesn't mean love, love believes everything. It means love believes the best about people. That's right. And another place says, and love covers a multitude of sins. That's right. So sometimes what we need to do with offenses is just let it go. So we, here we go, don't nurse them, don't curse, curse them, them, don't, don't rehearse them. them. So, well, what do I do with the offense? Well, here's what you do. We disperse them. The proper thing to do with offenses is to disperse them to God, releasing and forgiving those who offend us. This brings God's favor and grace upon our lives because we are responding the way Christ does toward us. So we disperse them to God. So how do we do that? There are four steps to dispersing our offenses. Here they are. Number one, by the way, I'll leave a copy of my notes here. Physical, if you want to, if anybody wants to have a copy of these notes. Thank you. So how do I disperse my offense to God? Number one, choose to forgive the person and say it out loud to God. And it's important that you say it out loud. Yeah. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And so you choose to forgive them. You say, well, and I've had people say this. Well, you know, I, I, I like to forgive them, but I just don't feel it. I just don't, you know, I just don't feel it. But here, God tells us, in, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, he talks about, uh, you know, the Lord's Prayer. And it says, you know, forgive us our debts as we forgive others their debts. And then after the 
Jesus gives the Lord's Prayer. He goes back to the forgiveness thing. He says, for if you don't forgive your brother who you can see, your Father in Heaven won't forgive you. That's kind of a big deal. And so, it, it, if God commands us to, to forgive, it must be possible to forgive, even if we don't feel it. For, forgiveness is not a feeling. Forgiveness is a choice of our will. We choose to, listen, choose to forgive, and then the feeling will change later. And so we, we make the choice to forgive and say it out loud. Here's another one, and that is make a decision never to rehearse the offense with anyone again. Now, if you slip up, forgive yourself, repent of it, but don't do it. That's the, that's the best thing. Make a decision never to rehearse the offense to anyone again. Here's another one. Choose to bless the person and pray for them each time the devil brings them to your mind. Now, we had a, uh, we were, when we were back when we were pastoring in Missouri, uh, we had a family in our church, and um, they would sit like right on the, right in the middle of the second row in front of the pulpit and where I, where I was preaching from, and um, this uh, couple in our church, the husband, uh, they, their, their house burnt down with a fire. And <clears throat> turns out that somebody came and burnt the house down. And then they traced it back to the husband. And so he went to prison for arson. Wow. And so when he went to prison for arson, uh, he claimed clearly that he never did that. It was, there was two guys that, that did it, and they claimed that he hired them. We don't know if it's true or not. But the court found him guilty, and they sent him to prison. Uh, and so I went to bat for him. I go visit him in prison, and then I wrote letters to the judge asking for mercy for him. In the meantime, we completely took care of his entire family, where we supported them, took care of all their bills and everything as from our church while he was in prison, and it got, he got let off early because of my letters to the judge. And so they're in the church, and one day uh, another couple comes to me from the church, and they go, um, they go, hey, uh, you know, so-and-so, they're just, they're just talking, they're just telling us what a terrible pastor you are, and what a terrible church we are, and all this, they're saying all this stuff, and I'm like, what? And so I call the couple into my office, and I said, hey, so-and-so said you would say, oh, no, we would never say anything like that. That's not true. I don't know where they got that. I'm like, oh, okay. A few weeks go by, a different couple comes to me. Says, do you know that so-and-so, they're just death on our church. I mean, they are just doing all this, you know. And um, so I call them in again. Hey, these people said that you're saying, oh, no, we would never say anything like that. Yeah, we don't know how they're, how they're getting that. So I'm kind of convinced now that it's really happening. And I'm like, oh, God, how do I get them out of my church? And then, to make matters worse, they move in next door to us. <laughs> and on one side of our house, we have all these big door windows and we get to look at them every day and by the way they, they leave the church uh, I, not, they just leave the church and they go to this other church then they get a phone call from the pastor of that church hey we got this family in our church and man they are they hate you and your church <laughs> like yeah I said but at least I don't have to look at them every Sunday <laughs> so now they're living next door I said oh god I don't get it. Why me? <laughs> and so the Lord says, bless them. Bless them. And that's the fourth thing, and that is do good if possible and bless them, acting on your commitment to forgive them. So we started to take gift certificates over to their house, pies, cookies, just over and over again. And you know what happened? They completely changed. They completely turned around and repented and became some of the best members in our church. 
Wow. In fact, her son ended up on the on the mission field. Oh, now that doesn't always happen. But this is understand what we're doing is we're getting set free ourselves. So do good to them. So don't nurse them. Don't curse them. Don't rehearse them. Disperse them. And the last one is God will reverse them. When we disperse the offenses to the Lord, the following things happen. Number one, I didn't say this earlier. When you hold unforgiveness to, uh, toward other people, you open a, a door to the devil into your life. In Ephesians it says, be angry but don't sin. Don't give the devil, the devil an opportunity in your life. So when we hold bitterness and, and, and resentment and unforgiveness in our heart toward other people, it literally gives the devil a legal right, to, that's where this tormenting comes in, to come in. And I believe there are, there are demonized Christians. How many of you believe Christians can have a demon? How many of you don't believe that Christians can have a demon? Okay, I believe Christians can have anything they want. <laughs> 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 and so we have demonized Christians that are really going around bringing about division in the church and, and spreading disease of, you know, uh, bitterness in the church and all that. And what they need to do is get delivered from evil spirits. And it, but that can't take place until they close the door. They have to close the door by forgiving. And so when we disperse our offense, the Lord closes the door of the enemy and takes away his legal right in our life. Another one is that God turns the offense into a blessing, causing growth and maturity in our lives and sets us free from self-centeredness. One of the purposes that God has in offenses is to get you free from you. Right? If you're easily offended, it's because there's something there there's something in you that makes you easily offended. And that's you. You're both, the, you know, everything's about you. The world is about you. But when you forgive, then you start growing up. You start growing in the Lord. Here's another one, and that is that God's love is released to you in a greater measure. So here it is. Every time we forgive, on being offended even if we've been betrayed and sometimes and we've been through lots of offenses but you know every time if you every time you respond correctly your capacity to love increases mm -hmm. Amen. and by the way you get harder to be offended I mean the goal is eventually to become offense free right yeah. then another thing that happens when we uh, do that is that we oh, and sometimes it opens the door to minister to the very one that offended us not always but there are I have times where it absolutely opens that door and in some cases it actually reverses the situation like what happened with this family in my, in my church yeah. and then for sure it glorifies God and causes you to sense his pleasure because you're acting exactly like he would act yeah. right. all right so that's the end of my message, and now I want to give us the opportunity to act on it, okay? Mm -hmm. And um, maybe you were sitting here and you discovered as we went through the signs that you might be harboring a uh, unresolved offense. I'm going to give you the opportunity to resolve it right now. Now, if there's something you, I knew, you're sitting here going, I know, already knew all this stuff, and, and I'm, that's how I live, and, and God bless you then take this as tools. Take this as tools because I guarantee there are offended people that you'll run into. Sure. <laughs> that you're going to have a relationship with. And we as our generation, we need to be helping the younger right. generation because Amen. if there was ever a time where people are offending one That's another right. and people don't know how to deal with offenses, it's now. So let's all stand up right now. And I just want to pray, and what's going to happen is, is that I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And in this prayer, you know, sometimes the way it works is that we, we, the people that have offended us, we put them in a cage, and then we put the cage inside of our heart. Mm -hmm. 
And then every once in a while, we get the cage out, open the door, take them out, beat them up. <laughs> and then we put them back in the cage and put it back in our hearts. Wow. Yes. Wow. So today what we're going to do is take the door off the cage. We're going to get them out. We're going to hold them in our hand. And we're going to say, I forgive you. By the way, I forgive you means you don't owe me anymore. You don't owe me anymore. And so you're going to say, I forgive you, and then you're going to release them to God. And as you do that, uh, there's going to be a sense of freedom that's going to come into you. And then I'm going to pray a prayer over you, and I'm going to command any demonic force that's been plaguing you, touching you in any way, I'm going to command those spirits to leave you. Also, I'm going to pray that God heals the wounds. See, when we get offended, it's a real wound in us. I mean, we're not acting like it's not there. We're admitting, I've been offended. I'm not saying you deny. Well, I'm, I, you know, you're going to self-denial of, no, no, I don't have an offense. No, I do have an offense. And I've been hurt and wounded. But praise God. The Bible talks about the bomb of Gilead. It's the oil of the Holy Spirit that comes in to heal those wounds. And I'm going to release that. And you will be healed in your soul, in your heart. Amen. All right? Yes. All right. Are we ready? Yes. We're ready. All right. So I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And uh, when I get to the point where I say, and I choose to forgive, I'm just going to stop and be quiet. While you take that opportunity, and I'm not asking you to shout out their names here, because <laughs> it might be somebody in the room. <laughs> I'm just probably not. If it is, go. On. But what you're going to do is just you're going to just speak to them, and you're going to say, "I forgive you." I don't care how deep of a hurt it was. You know, how many of you have seen, we've all lived long enough to see Christian families whose children have been murdered or butchered or raped or all that. They go to court and they stand there looking at the person, the perpetrator that committed the crime. And they stand there and look them in the eye and say, we forgive you. That doesn't mean the crime goes away, right? Or the punishment goes away necessarily. But they're releasing themselves. Yes, that's right. You know, we choose. Christ forgave us. We've sinned. All have sinned. We come short of the glory of God. We choose to forgive. So when I get to that point, you're going to choose to forgive them. And then you're just going to release them to God. When you do that, I believe there's going to be a new level of God's presence in the midst of us here. Ongoing from now. And you're going to have a greater sense of freedom. All right, so here we go. Say, Jesus. Jesus. Thank you, Thank you for dying for my sins, for, dying for, my sins. For, becoming a curse for, me. for becoming a curse for me, for suffering for me, for suffering for me. Taking, upon taking upon yourself all my hurts, all my hurts and, wounds and wounds and offenses. And, offenses. and I thank you, and I thank you. For forgiving, me. for forgiving me, for choosing to forgive me. For choosing to forgive me. And now, and now, in your name, in your name I, choose to forgive. I choose to forgive. All right, here's your opportunity just to get them out of the cage. Hold them in your hand. You might have multiple people. You may need to do more of this after the service here. But you're going to choose to forgive them. I choose to forgive you. You do not owe me any more. Maybe it's been a pastor that's hurt you, a leader, a father, a mother, a relative, a close friend that betrayed you and hurt you. But you're going to let them go. You're not going to drink the poison anymore, thinking it's hurting them. But I already sense the Holy Spirit coming right now. It's coming, and now... All right, I'm just going to pray over you right now. I'm just going to take authority. Father, in the name of Jesus, I just speak now to every demonic force, every de demon, every 
uh, spiritual force of wickedness that would attack anyone in this room, they are now closing the door to you. They're taking away your legal right right now, and I command you to leave them now in Jesus' name. You leave them now. You have no longer any permission to be in their life. We close the door right now. We close the door to the devil. Close the door to his torment. Close the door to his influence uh, right now in Jesus' name. And I command you to leave them alone. Get away from them. You have no authority. We have all authority Amen. over you. We command you to leave them now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Take a deep breath in and let it out. Go now in Jesus' name. 